The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Hey Karen, what are we gonna do in today's episode? Well, whenever we have an episode that features you soldering, we get a lot of comments on how people like to watch you solder. So what if we have you create a circuit and just watch you solder a lot? Like a close up, 100% soldering episode? Extreme close up. That's fine by me, I won't have to shave. Yeah, and then maybe we can use that circuit in a future episode to show off our design process. Okay, so we'll make an episode all about soldering, and then we'll show you how we take the part that we build and turn it into a finished product. Yeah. Uh, we have some old Atari 2600s laying around. We can take the three chips out of that, put it onto a perf board, and solder it up into a complete working system. Sounds like it's gonna be a great episode. Let's get soldering. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. This is our PCB that we're going to be attaching our integrated circuits to. I made it pretty small based off the size of the device I intend to build. So there are three main chips in the Atari 2600. There's the 6507, which is a CPU. It's a variant of the 6502. There is a RAM input output timer chip or Riot. And this is the custom video chip, which is used for generating the TV signal. I also have a uh, printout of the chips pinout so I can reference it because the schematic doesn't actually have everything in order but this does so I can see some similarities like D0 through D7 here the D0 through D5 here lined up so I mean just like this is probably a pretty decent orientation as far as the CPU is concerned I mean it could go two ways I'm thinking it either goes like this or like this so any passives that I need to add I'm going to put here here or on the bottom. Okay, so I'm gonna set these upside down, make sure that they're all the way through so they're all level. Most integrated circuits of this type through hole are all the same height, which is about 0.2 inches. And I'm gonna solder the opposite pins first, just to hold it in place. Got my iron at about 525 Fahrenheit. And then I'm going to actually push down a little bit just to make sure that they're fully flat, which they probably are. Okay, now that the chips are in place, I will solder the rest of it. Oh yeah. So when you're soldering, kind of the rule is you're heating the part, or in this case, the pin, and then you're bringing the solder to it. Although I just tend to kind of just hit them at the both at the same time. So it's kind of like go in there and you bzoo, bzoo. On this side, it's a little harder because the pin is over on the right side of the via. So if I turn it like this, I could actually get more surface area. See how my iron, since I'm right-handed, my iron hits both the pad and the pin. And that makes it a little easier because you can apply heat to it over a greater area. There we go. Happy little solder. This is not a good solder joint, so you always want to make sure that the solder completely flows around the pin. There's another one that doesn't quite do that. And that's why it's good not to hit the pad on the edge, but actually get it on the inside to make sure the solder flows all around it. Because usually it's the gap of the drilled hole that causes the solder to not fully form. All right, I'll just continue to do all of these. I don't know how mesmerizing people find this.
a lot of solder fumes in my face today. Um, it's probably not a bad idea to have a small fan to blow the fumes away from you, although that will cool down your iron, so you have to balance that. And I'm uh, flowing all these with solder, so I don't have to later when I'm attaching the wires. So it's one less thing to worry about. The tip of your iron should stay nice and silvery. If it starts getting blackened and dirty, you should wipe it off with your sponge. I don't know if you can see it, but this is kind of a chisel tip. See how it uh, comes down a little bit here? It's not just you know completely rounded. That allows you to press in and get a better surface area onto the part that you're heating up. So the tips are usually not just a straight tip. They usually have some amount of chisel to them. Now I'm going to start soldering the buses. So there's an address bus and a data bus. I think I'll start with the data bus since it is only eight connections. Okay, so if that's the way it's going down the bottom, I think what I'll do is I'll start up here and bring things down and also look for any common connections along the way. So I've got all of my fine wire here. Oh yeah, look at that. I'm gonna go in half like this. It's like like knot school, you know, where they teach you how to make knots. So I used my uh, fingernail to actually pull back the plastic in the middle of the wire. And that's handy because then you don't have to uh, connect the wire twice. So I can just go like that. There we go. Okay, I have to remember that this is this. So I'm gonna come up like this. And again, trying to make, uh, kind of, you know, if you can, make it kind of look like a circuit. Okay, I'm gonna, <clears throat> wire the top, or well, I guess it's the bottom of the bus, the LSB, least significant bit. There we go. Okay, so the reason I did the top and the bottom there was because I just wanna see the spacing. So I come up and I go over. So I'm gonna bend these like a circuit or like Beckham. Who? <laughs> okay. So that'll kind of give me a preview of how much space I'm gonna have. So I think what I'll do is I'll continue to go down this way and populate these. That way I don't bunch it up too much. VH1's behind the music. Whatever happened to Kira Knightley? You'd best start believing in ghost stories, Kira Knightley. You're it. who are you? Note how I keep all of the wires on the same level, just like traces on a circuit board. This helps me keep track of the signals and also reduces the space consumed by the circuit since I'm not piling the wires on top of each other unless absolutely necessary. The abundance of solder on each pin helps me here. There's lots of surface area to hit with the iron to make sure it heats up the solder to attach the wire. The solder should surround both the wire and the pin for a good connection. Hmm, it kind of looks like little metallic Hershey's Kisses, doesn't it? It's kind of a cheap method, but you can strip wire by heating the end and causing the plastic coating to contract, exposing the wire. It's not always clean, but it is handy when the connections are too small to reach with your cutters or fingers. I'm trying to keep the wire ends on the side of the pin so I know there's a good connection. It's soldered along the wire instead of just the tip of it. If it is just the tip of the wire connecting, we might not actually have a very good connection and it can break easily. Okay, so I wanna keep these wires away from this pin because this is a power pin. So I think I might glue these right like that just to have a little bit of separation, but the wires are still in order. That's good because then I don't have to go back and uh, test them all. Uh, now these wires haven't been connected yet because before I was just going, see how I went in a line along the bus. I think I will do like a little bit of a jump here. 
So this is the end of the bus here. And these wires have already been used so I can thread through them safely. Now I'm adding just enough heat to cause the solder to flow. If I add too much heat, this wire that I've placed will pop up. So it's all about timing. There we go. So now I'm gonna bring these over. I'm just gonna go straight over and go between these wires here. See that? That's okay because since I've hooked up the bus to this, I don't have to hook anything else up. So it's done, so to speak. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So six, seven, this is seven here. No, oh, that's six. Okay, so this is six. So we're gonna go up again, just like we're wiring a circuit. Now, when you're attaching a small wire like this, you should point it down a little bit. That ensures that it is as low as possible to, and close to the pin in the copper. Because if you have it up at an angle, see how obviously I can't get it all the way down there because of the thickness of my tweezers. But if you poke it in like that, the thickness of your tweezers doesn't matter. Ta-da! See? All right. Now this one, I'm gonna do the same thing. Gonna come up. Now it has to go over the other one, which is okay. Same as I did up there. That's gonna happen. It's gonna come right over. That. In these situations, I use the X-Acto knife to cut the wire just to make sure it's exactly what I need it to be. Uh, the angle cutters might be a little imprecise for this. All right, so that is the data bus completed on this circuit. Again, this will go to the cartridge slot, but we'll wire that separately. Oh man, I need to take a vacation. I think I'll do that next week. But what about the show? How will we fill in the gaps when I'm gone? You know what, Ben, I can help you out. Oh, cool. I will host the show in your absence. That makes sense. For an episode, I'll build an acoustic electric guitar that records itself without any external uh, devices or equipment. So the music will go onto an SD card or something? Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty cool. All right then, I've got nothing to worry about. Okay, so next week while Ben is on his vacation, I will host a show, build this acoustic guitar, and I'll see you then. wire the address buses next. Okay, there are a total of 13 address lines on the CPU going from A0 to A12, which means the CPU can address 8K of memory. What they did in the Atari was the cartridge was, the, was at the top of memory and the IO, there wasn't much of it, but it's at the bottom of memory, which is actually also how the Nintendo works. So as far as the position of it, most of it's here on the chip. So I'm thinking what I'll do is I'll attach it here and then come down like that, and then grab these along the way marked red, and then branch over to this chip. Or what I could do is I could come, come from this chip, go up, come over, grab it on the CPU, come down, attach here, and then extend down here to the cartridge. That actually might be best. I only need to expose a small length of wire to get it to attach to these pins. The plastic will contract more as you heat it. In fact, if I peel too much wire and then it contracts, I might leave too much exposed wire, which could short out to something else.
I'm going to bring these gray wires down and attach them on top of the black wires. But again, I'm keeping them in sequence. So it's address zero, one, two, three, four, five. And these are attached directly here, but I also have to attach to this other chip. But I, what I think I'll do is I'll complete this and then I'll attach it to the third chip because this chip only has a few address lines. So I'll actually use it as the odd man out or the odd chip out. Be sure to hold the wires in position after soldering so it doesn't pop out of the solder before it cools. The solid strand wire has tension and will try to spring back into its original position. Notice how I wait briefly after each connection. One thing you can look for is the solder to turn from shiny to dull. This tells you it has finished cooling and then you can let go. Okay, this is all of the address lines going from the RAM to the CPU. I still need to attach them over to the TIA. I will do that next. And once I do that, then we pretty much have the entire address bus wired. So I think the most elegant way to attach these six address lines to the bus will be to go over the top of the chips from here to here. That way it keeps the bottom of it fairly open. So that's what I'm gonna do. More soldering. Soldering to the top of pins is something you usually only see on reworks or board fixes, but for a one-off, it certainly does work here. Keep in mind that adding more solder above and below the pin can make it harder to desolder later on, should you need to do that. The solder mass will take longer to heat back up, the suction won't be able to get at it all, and excess solder can hide places you might not be able to see it. Now I'm going to start attaching some passives, capacitors, resistors, that are needed to operate the chips. So one of those passives is a pull up on the reset line. Now reset is active low, so if you keep it high, the CPU will continue to run. However, it's a good idea to actually have it reset for the first few cycles when you start out. By attaching a capacitor, it'll give us a slight delay where we'll actually hold the processor and reset for a little bit of time until the system is ready to go. You don't need a timing circuit for that or anything else fancy, just, just a capacitor, yeah, it was the 70s. Nom, 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 nom. I'm mounting this surface mount capacitor sideways to save as much vertical space as possible. I'm also using bits of spare cutoff leads, which kind of look like giant rebar in this close up, to create the power and ground buses between the chips. And if I'm clumsy, solder wick can help suck up the excess solder without having to heat up the desoldering iron. Just like below the circuit board, I'm keeping everything up on top, neat and in order. This saves space and also helps me keep track of what is what. If I have to troubleshoot something later on, that will be very helpful to know where everything is. These are 1206 size surface mount parts. I can secure them between pads and keep isolation, as long as I don't add too much solder. Surface mount parts tend to want to stand on end, or tombstone, when heated on just one side, so it's important to hold them down as you solder both sides. Keeping them as flat as possible will prevent solder from being trapped underneath, causing a short circuit that you can't see. Thank you. 
This is a row of passive components that are all going to positive five volts. First, I solder them down as straight as possible. Then I solder in the power rail to the opposite end of them. I'm pushing them against the pins on the integrated circuit to make sure I have as much room as possible on the other side, so I won't hit the black wire accidentally when I go in to solder the power rail. I hooked up a cartridge slot to the Atari circuitry so I can do a test. Um, obviously, these wires will be arranged a lot better than this, but we just wanna see if it works. So we have power, ground, and I'm gonna use this oscilloscope to see if there's a heartbeat. So this is something that oscilloscope's really good for. You can see if it's working even if you don't have everything finished. So I'm going to apply the five volts, and this signal here is a uh, 3.58, etc. megahertz NTST color burst signal, which is being generated by this oscillator right here that I wired on top. It's a uh, inverter, IC, and a crystal. So when you had your NTSC uh, color television, there was a certain frequency at which the color could change, and that's what this crystal's for. So in the Atari, that crystal goes into the video chip, and then the video chip divides it by three to drive the CPU. So we see that the oscillator's working, so I'm gonna check the clock going to the CPU, the input clock. All right, all right, we're getting the correct uh, frequency, which is 1.19 megahertz. So now I wanna check the address bus, and I don't have my logic analyzer hooked up, but I don't really need it. I'm just gonna go to the A12 line on the CPU. That's the line that activates the cartridge, so when it's reading the cartridge memory, that line will go high. Okay, yeah, we actually have a pattern here, so it looks like code is executing. We can also check the data lines. I guess we could look at data zero, which would be this. Yeah, it's definitely changing, that's good. Just to double check that that's not an anomaly, we can remove the cartridge, start it up again, and look at the same A12 line and see that it's just high. So the cartridge is definitely being accessed correctly. The system is working. The next thing to do is to attach the video circuit. Okay, Karen, here is the complete Atari 2600 that I wired up in excruciating close-up detail. Ooh, close-up. That looks really nice. Thank you. It's very nice and tidy. That's all tucked in there. Yeah. That's, that's really good. It's kind of like sewing in a way. You know, where you're moving the wires and like, you know, weaving them through each other and trying to keep everything level and neat. So, did you have any problems when you were soldering this? Yeah, well, it wasn't really a problem with the soldering, but I was using a surface mount inverter chip with the crystal to create an oscillator to go into the video chip, and I wasn't getting a good signal, and it was actually, I believe it was the uh, type of Schmidt trigger that was on the knot gate I was using. Mm -hmm. So I ended up using this larger through-hole knot gate. I cut off the leads and put it with the crystal, and it worked properly. Excellent. So it was one of those things where like, I'm not gonna spend any more time trying to get this tiny part to work. I use a slightly larger part that I know works. So once you get this all tested out, these are gonna get tucked in here. You'll clean up this rat's nest a little bit, make this shorter and tidier. Yeah, the these are just a dial in the video. Okay. Uh, so yeah, these will be built in here in the end. And this will be over like this for the cartridge. Okay. So once we know what the case is gonna be like, I'll just rewire these and cut these to the minimum distance. Uh, so yeah, in a future episode, we're gonna draw this into the computer and then show you our actual design process, how we go from this to a finished design. And we'll also talk about the decisions we make along the way as to doing 3D printing, laser cutting, and CNC machining. If you have any questions about this build or if you'd like to give us ideas for builds in the future, let us know in the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. And remember, you can find me as The Heck With Karen on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and in your YouTube comments. We'll see you next time. What happened to your master? Well, he got stuck behind a frogger wall and <laughs> I couldn't get to him before this Halloween mask guy killed him. I guess he was bad. He was painted red with horns. Yeah, did he think he actually did? I was like, hmm, maybe Colin's right. Maybe I did eat that bread. He's like, oh, I guess I didn't. Inception, I give you the gift of magic crackers. We have a new mission for you, Ethan Hunt. You must find two flashcards. Micro SD card that you must get. It wasn't even finished when I played it. It seemed like a beta or something.
Yeah, I thought it was a Steam Greenlight, but no, it was a, you know, triple-A game. <laughs> I, I remember it being, I think it was directed by Hideo Kojima. I'm not sure, though. I might have to play the game for three minutes to double-check. Is <laughs> Venom quoted as saying, blah, 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 blah. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.